Good Wednesday morning, and today we'll be talking with Dr. John Patrick. And the title for today's talk is A Recipe for Surviving the Modern World. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to start by reading uh, a paragraph to you. In the Republic's grand arc of political decline, democracy emerges from oligarchy, a regime ruled by stingy and avaricious, avaricious money makers. Oligarchy contains the seeds of its own destruction. The children of the wealthy are used to luxury and unaccustomed to labours in body and soul, weak in resisting pleasures and pains, and idle. The old misers are furthermore happy to make loans to this spoiled cohort. This produces a class of indebted and dishonoured young men, hating and plotting against those who acquired their property and all the rest, and longing for political change. The revolutionary longing of these frustrated and dispossessed elites finds fulfilment in democracy, which is characterised by freedom and free speech, personal licence, the indulgence of criminals, the neglect of education, and the equality of equals and unequals alike. Licence and levelling go hand in hand because the acknowledgement of a fundamental difference between what is noble and base, good and bad, hinders the unrestricted satisfaction of individual desire. The de democratic man turns a deaf ear to the admonishments of older relatives and banishes shame and moderation, calling them foolish, foolishness and cowardliness. Um, that sounds very modern, doesn't it? But it was written uh, by Plato four centuries before Christ. It's not new. You could, you would have to make very little adjustment for that to make it a description of our world, uh, where the young are refusing all responsibility, and using. I love that line that he had: the equality of equals and unequals alike. Once that happens, of course, there's no such thing as real competence. And of course, you can't actually allow it to happen. If you're sick, you're not going to allow anybody to operate on you. Um, but that's where we've got to. So what on earth is going on? The other phrase that fits in there very well that I read this week, uh, when I get a bit stuck or bored, I just pick up a book I really like and read a bit of it. And uh, I picked up The Lord of the Rings. And my favourite scene in The Lord of the Rings is... Uh, at the end of the, the great chase of the hobbits who'd been abducted by the orcs across the plains of Rohan and more, uh, ends when the three chasers, Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli, are met by Aomer and the riders of Rohan. And he's supposed to take them prisoner and take them back to uh, the capital, but they are going to follow after the, uh, the hobbits and a confrontation occurs in which Aoma proves himself to be a real man um, in his response, because Aragorn says to him, paraphrasing slightly, good and bad are not one thing amongst men and another amongst dwarves and elves, and it is a man's part to discern them. He's simply saying to Aoma, you ought to be able to look at us, talk to us, and make a decision. And that's exactly what he did, does, and he makes the right one. He breaks the, the protocols, the bureaucratic guidelines that have been set down for him and says, okay, not only will I not take you back to Edoras, I'll give you a couple of horses on your promise that you'll return them. Tolkien was well aware of this phenomenon um, that was happening. He was, he was, in fact, ahead of the curve. In fact, all the inklings who were talking about where education was going to go after the Second World War, it sometimes hard to realise that these great books were written under very trying circumstances. Uh, and when the inklings met, they might be lucky enough to have a fire and they might not. Uh, but what, which of us wouldn't give you know, our right arm to be able to sit in on those discussions? Um, but the world was changing and they knew it. Uh, Lewis was writing the Narnia stories. 
uh, Tolkien was writing The Lord of the Rings, and their discussions were about things like the abolition of man, which is where we've got to. It's all about character. You know, the reason The Lord of the Rings is so successful, I think, is that we are built with a capacity to recognize a good person. Um, and what you're looking at there is truly admirable people in very different ways. I mean, the extraordinary creatures that he produced in Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli and all the elder, so to speak, is one thing. But we relate to the hobbits because they are very like us, except Frodo is incredibly humble. But he knows how to do his duty. Um, he knows what it is. There's no, no question about what right and wrong are in their world. Uh, we don't have that anymore. And we've forgotten what it is. Uh, the word virtue is not used in university. Uh, wisdom is not talked about. Because they don't believe it exists anymore. It's a, it's a frightening situation to get into. And it's what drives me on because there are people out there who you only have to give them a little push in the right direction and they fly because they've been looking for what they should have been taught at school. Uh, and, and they weren't. And I didn't realize that I was in the last, really, uh, I suppose, the last group of people who had the opportunity for a real education. Um, the people who founded Augustine College with me, I was the idiot of the group because I'd gone the science track. Everybody else spoke five languages. They'd had a proper education. I got a, a late education via my contact with them in that respect. I also, however, had one thing that really helped, and that was a, a knowledge of the Bible that was put into me because my parents and the church I went to loved the scriptures. And so Sunday school, you see, has died out, hasn't it, in many ways, in many parts of the world. America keeps it because they do it uh, on Sunday morning. It was Sunday afternoon for years and years and years, but in Britain it's died. Now, what happened there was that children were taught the scriptures, and that enters into your soul. And what it does is not even something that you are, think about or know, it becomes what uh, Polanyi called tacit knowledge, things we know without thinking about it. The number of things that we can trust other people will know and take as good and true is diminishing rapidly. De Tocqueville, who wrote the best book in many ways on America, saw this as a problem in the future. Uh, the homogenization of society uh, without without the recognition that we are not equal and never will be equality of outcome is simply a, a nonsense idea cannot possibly be true unless you say that people like down syndrome children are not people at all because nobody can deny that intellectually they're going to be equal with everybody else they're not but they're fundamental to educating the rest of us because they're still innocent in so many ways, and we've lost our innocence, and we try to rationalize our sins. That's where we've got to, and we don't have any book behind us that would point us in the right direction. Hence my love of, of the Beatitudes, because there they do, they lay it out in, well, not they, I mean, it's, it's our Lord. In just a few verses, he gives you a way to train yourself, your children, uh, and those that will listen to you, and you, you should do it every day. Uh, I go through those instructions almost every day at some point, just to remind myself. The starting point is truth about who we are. We are all sinners. There is an objective law out there. We know we've broken it. To deny that uses all sorts of psychic energy, and in the end you end up anxious. Whereas... People have got that really under their belt, unless they have uh, an anxiety due to a metabolic uh, defect, which does happen. But most anxiety is not produced that way. It's produced by the mismatch between what we know we ought to be and what we are. 
uh, Jesus takes that as, as the starting point for character building. Face the truth about who you are. And if you, don't, if you think it's good, get down on your knees and ask for some insight. You, if you get down on your knees and ask for insight, you, you will not get up the same person. We, we all have this problem. Uh, and he says, well, don't worry about it. An astonishing thing to say, but that's where he says, the kingdom is yours. Doesn't feel like it, but then he's not talking about feeling, he's talking about process. Uh, because you become addicted to truth. And as long as you hold on to truth telling in, in the inward parts, you will get to a good space in due course. And he says, the next thing you've got to do, though, is, is even harder. Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mourning in this context, I believe, to be talking about repentance. Uh, Lewis says in, in, uh, in Mere Christianity that repentance is not something God demands of us that he could forego if he wished. It's simply a description of what coming to God is like. And we can't even do it spontaneously. We need help. We have to ask for the gift of repentance and it will be given. And Christ is good to us. Um, he gives it to us in manageable bites. And it appears to me that when you get to the end of your life, you realize that everything you've done was merely necessary process to what comes next. I love Aquinas' uh, end of life experience where he says, I met with Jesus, and he never wrote another word after that. That puts everything into perspective. Uh, Newton, who was also a believer, a rather odd one, but a believer, at the end of his life, he says, having written the, bre the greatest single author scientific text of all time that will never be repeated, he says, oh, I feel rather like a little boy who was sitting on the sand and picking up a pebble, looking at it and then throwing it away to look at another pebble. That's how he described being the greatest scientist of all time uh, in terms of authoring a, 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 a textbook. Uh, we've been throwing pebbles, but now we're going to see what, what's really good. What's to come is beyond belief. Obviously, we can't even imagine it at the moment. But the comfort of repentance is well is well known. That's uh, detectives couldn't do the work their work if people who've committed heinous crimes have a deep, deep need to confess them uh, because they're human. If they don't want to confess them, uh, they've lost their humanity completely. So uh, you can go on through the, the sequence. The next one is exactly what Frodo is. He's driven by the recognition that he's been called to do something and he's able to do it, although he doesn't think he is. And he simply goes on following that inner injunction. That's what meekness is, being ready to follow the master wherever he leads. In fact, as I've said before, the lovely picture behind that word is of being a horse trained and ready to ride into battle. That, that makes life very much better. And you inherit the kingdom. You inherit the earth, he says. Uh, and this week I happened to come to Psalm 37 in my reading, and that's where I'd forgotten it was there that in the middle of that psalm, which begins with, fret not yourself for evildoers. Don't get worried by the fact that bad people appear to be winning. The end is still in God's hands. And he says, the meek shall inherit the earth. Uh, you don't inherit something that makes you feel guilty and awkward and uncomfortable. Uh, the inheritance is, I think, the immaterial goods of the world rather than the material ones. Uh, that changes your character. So that the next thing you want is to do something about it. Now, it took me 40 years to get to that in any serious sense beyond my family. But it's been the most satisfying outcome for me. I mean, here I am in my 80s still doing this sort of thing and, and having people be nice to me about it. That's hard to beat as a, a retirement project. Uh, 
well, it started before retirement, but it's been going it's been going a long while. But it, it's been deeply satisfying. Is deeply satisfying, which is exactly what he says. The promise: those who hunger and thirst to make the world a better place, in one way or another, they're going to taste satisfaction. The real thing is not for now, it, but the process is there, and uh, those are friends of a very high order. Uh, that. That leads on to the next. You put those things together and you become merciful because the first thing to do whenever anybody attacks you, says anything nasty about you, whatever, is to say, well, thank you, Lord. It could have been the other way around. I could have been doing the attacking instead of being attacked. And there's no question in the, in the economy of the kingdom, it's better to be attacked than to be attacking. Uh because we don't have to worry about the ultimate outcome. We're promised the, the ultimate outcome. And I can honestly say, uh, the upbringing I had, uh, rooted in the scriptures, gave me a, a recognition that there was nothing to fear, nothing to worry about. I, I, anxiety has never been a problem of any sort to me. Um, uh, so I, I'm not courageous in that sense because I don't get anxious. Uh, my wife and I often have to say to people, say, when we went to Africa in a time where it, there was no law in the bit we were in, people said, you're crazy to go. And my response was, well, no, um, if this is what God wants me to do, I won't die one minute earlier in Central Africa than I would in Ottawa. And we had an amazing experience at one point. We, Shortly before the Rwanda war blew up and Sally was called into working with the, the tragedies that followed and running several refugee camps for a couple of years. Um, there was, wasn't even email, so we had virtually no contact. About once every two or three months, we would have some contact when she happened to find, get herself into a place where there was a telephone and occasionally an email by courtesy of MAF. But that was it. But shortly before that happened, before we knew what was going to happen, we were held up at night. Uh, we'd had a breakdown. You shouldn't be out on the roads in that part of the world at night uh, by a drunken soldier with a Kalashnikov. And the soldiers were Roberts. Uh, Mobutu didn't pay them. He said, take the money you need from the people. Uh, the week before on that road, two boys had been shot because they wouldn't give their goat to a soldier. Nothing had happened to the soldier. Um... And he made one big mistake. He got us out of the vehicle and didn't do anything for a moment or two. That was my wife, uh, myself, my son, and a few Africans. And after a few minutes, I said to Jonathan, are you afraid? And he said, no, I'm not. Isn't that strange? He said, neither am I, and neither is your mother. And he knows that. And it's worrying him a lot. And then out of nowhere... One o'clock in the morning, a sober soldier of a higher rank appeared and we were free. We had no idea what that was about, except that we had been where you should have been terrified and we weren't even quivering. And when we got where we went, we just went to sleep in the usual way. We didn't know that we were going to be separated for a couple of years and neither of us were worried by that process. Um, the missionaries wanted to, to give Sally a T-shirt which said no fear on it, which is true. But that means you're not courageous. Courage is overcoming fear. We didn't have any. That's all part of character building. I mean, you read the stories of the martyrs, they were not afraid of dying. That's the difference between us and the early church. The early church, they, they understood Words that we read and don't take seriously. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the pain for what was put before him. The road to the cross was in one sense not a Via Dolorosa. It was a triumphal march. As Paul expressed it later, he took captivity captive and set us free. And it's all there in embryo, in, in the Beatitudes. So mercy is what happens when you receive mercy. If you don't give mercy, you haven't got it and you won't have it. 
It's the only thing repeated in the whole sermon. If you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven because you haven't begun to understand what it's all about. Uh, the next one is the one I haven't reached in any way. The pure in heart shall see God. Um, I think for most of us that's very near the end or the next world. But you can on occasions make peace. And suffering is not a problem. Um, in fact, Jesus says when you rejoice, when people persecute you and do bad things to you for my name's sake, rejoice which tells us something else that our world desperately needs to learn. Rejoicing is not a feeling. There is a subjective aspect to it, but Christian rejoicing is rational. He says, just look where you are. Who's been here before you? The prophets, the martyrs, they've all been where you are now, and your reward in heaven is great. You have good reason to rejoice as a Christian. That doesn't mean an ear-splitting grin, but it means that, that quiet confidence and also an increased capacity to see the ironies of life, of which there are many. So what this does, this whole process, is change your, your priorities of the goods. Our modern world is suffering from what McIntyre said it would suffer from, that, that we, because we are after virtue, most people couldn't even define what it is. And it certainly isn't part of our lives in the way that it ought to be. Uh, we're in trouble. Now, virtue came when people inhabited stories and, and lived by them. Thus, my working class upbringing, in terms of what was right and what was wrong, there was no argument. America in its foundings was incredibly blessed because it didn't have to argue about what good and evil were. There was a general consensus. And the sheer size of America meant that decisions had to be put out to the periphery because it would take months to get to the most distant people. And where did those decisions happen? They happened in the church primarily. Town meetings happened as well, but the church provided the, the underpinnings, if you like, you know, the foundations on which you could build. And that's what we've lost. Um, it requires us as Christians to come to life again and start seriously studying and thinking about what our life should be like and then going through that process, facing the truth, repenting, uh, agreeing that we are followers, not leaders, and getting the peace that flows from that and the energy that's needed to do those things. A lot of kids out there now are emotionally flattened by COVID and by the fact that the story they inhabit, like the one that pre preceded the decline of Greece, inevitably, um, they're in that state. They have no, no drive of curiosity that they used to have. I mean, the late teens used to be a time of great confidence, great curiosity, I can do anything, and it's not now. Uh, at Augustine, where we've been teaching these things for 25 years plus, we realize we've got to rethink because the students coming out of high school are not capable of handling what we've been dishing out in the past. Um, we're not sure what we should do, but the people we really need to get our hands on are those students who are in university and deeply disappointed by the experience they need to come and do eight months with us. They won't be disapp disappointed with the content. And they'll be ready for the, the answers that are tough, but eternal. Um, we've always had a few students every year, or sometimes only one, uh, and occasionally none. But normally we would have some students who'd been in, in university or got a degree. Uh, and they get the most out of it. But they also said to the others, look, you're not going to have an experience like this again. Make the most of it. And that's true. So uh, we don't offer any credits because we only teach one course. But uh, we can get around that by uh, networking if people want to go on into uh, higher education, so-called. And it's hard to find now. So what that means is we've created by the grace of God, people whose character is tough enough to handle the modern world. 
One of the first things they learn, of course, is that tolerance is not a virtue. We teach them that straight away. Tolerance is a recognition that we're sinners. That's why we need it, because none of us are perfect. So we need some, we need some tolerance in the system. I mean, the place to start thinking about tolerance is to think about engineering. Engineering works because things are made to within given tolerances. And if they're outside that tolerance, you toss it aside. It doesn't go into the machine. And the better your, tolerance, your intolerance of being away from the best position, the better the machine you make. So, same is true of humans. Those who have learned to be intolerant of bad behavior do well. The Ten Commandments can be rewritten as the Ten Divine Intolerances. And they are the framework. Keep these rules, says God to Moses, and you will flourish as the Jews have done. I say lots of things again and again and again. Some people ask me why, but most people don't. But when they do, if some of you have listened to this and said, I've heard that before, my answer is, have you done it? John, at the end of his life, was alleged to go. When asked to preach, he would say, brethren and sisters, love one another. And they would say, but you said that last time. And he would say, but you're not doing it yet. Because when that happens, the rest follows. I hope that's of help. I hope that it's balm for the soul. And I hope it leads you into repentance. Thank you, Dr. John. And thank you guys all for listening. If you guys are enjoying this, please subscribe. Share it with a friend. If you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe there as well. If you guys have questions, feel free to ask that by going to the link in the description down below or going to www.johnpatrick.ca forward slash ask. Thank you guys, and we'll see you next week.